Um, welcome tonight. Uh, this is our, our last lecture of the year here at uh, Lawrence Tech, uh, although there's another lecture that we're having on Monday, so they, we keep on adding them. Um, and um, so I thank you all for coming, and it looks like we're going out in grand style. Uh, my name is Glenn Leroy, and I'm the Dean of the College of Architecture and Design. And you're here on a very special night for us uh, because it involves numerous events that are colliding uh, all this, uh, uh, you know, all this week. And, um, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. I think I'm supposed to stand here in the, does it look better? Yeah, in the limelight. So um, before we uh, move any further though, I would like to introduce uh, our president, uh, Dr. Verinder Modgill. And uh, just in, in terms of introduction, for those of you that have not met him yet, and many of you have, Dr. Modgill was named the seventh president of Lawrence Technological University in the spring of 2000, um, 2012. Yes, yes, already, how, how time passes. And assumed his office on July uh, 1st. Uh, prior to joining Lawrence Tech, he was the provost of Oakland University where he had a stellar record of exemplary academic progress and program development. Dr. Madgyal holds three degrees, including a doctorate from Banaras Hindu University, which is ranked as the top university in India. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the Mayo Clinic he has also held adjunct professorships at uh, Wayne State University and has been a visiting scientist at universities in Serbia, France, and India. I now call on Dr. Modgill to deliver some opening remarks. Thank you, Dean Leroy. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very special occasion. I don't think in Lawrence Tech since been here I have seen the size of this crowd. This speaks for itself. This is a very special time for College of uh, Architecture and Design for Lawrence Tech and our visitors and friends, students and faculty. Uh, when I moved here from Oakland University, where I maintain many friends, some are actually in the audience, my colleagues from Oakland, uh, I had a chance to visit uh, with my former president at a uh, social gathering. And he asked me, he said, Verinder, how is it going at Lawrence Tech? I said, it's going well. He said, you got the College of Architecture. That's the only thing he remembered, that he thought it was so good, nationally known, renowned for its contribution and the quality of education. So I'm very, very privileged to be with you tonight. So I'd like to thank you all for attending the Taubman Lecture Series at the College of Architecture and Design. Featuring, to, featuring tonight's speaker, Tom Main, whom I have known for some time, an outstanding leader in the area, in the nation, perhaps in the world. He's a member of FAIA. I also want to thank all those who attended AIA's student auction tonight and continue to support our student organization and their missions. With Mr. Taubman's continuing support over the last three years, we have been able to deliver one of the preeminent architecture and design lecture series in the United States. Having Tom Main, the 2013 American Institute of Architects gold medalist, that is same as the Nobel Prize in Science in architecture. He's the gold medal winner as tonight's speaker emphasizes the excellence of this program and of the college. We are also delighted that Mr. Main is the design architect for our next building on this campus, the Taubman Engineering, Life Sciences, and Architectural Building. So this is a great relationship. We are justifiably proud of the college architecture and design. I speak about it all the time. Many of you have listened to me bragging about the, the alumni of this college. You know, there are many moms in the area, and, and the daughters are the prettiest in town always to moms. But external validation is very important. So when I travel, I talk about alumni because what they do in the real world is a real testament to this college and its training. So if you go around in the area, if you live here, the best malls here are designed by our graduates from this college. You go, we had a reception at the Oakland County Airport, designed by a graduate of this college. Then you see you go to play football, you sit in this large stadium, 
designed by our graduate, where lines play, on and on, the list goes on. I think if you consider the beauty of architecture and the impact it has on society and people who enjoy that, it's a direct testament and compliment to this college. Our professors, staff, faculty, obviously our students who bring that notoriety and prestige uh, to this college and this university. The, even during the Great Depression, some call it recession, that happened during 27, uh, 207 meltdown of economy. This college continued to progress, technically multidisciplinary program, professional schools in architecture design continue to go forward with great programs, additional programs, and operating in Southfield, Detroit, and globally. Last year, graduates from the College of Architecture and Design exceeded the professional employment rate among recent graduates by over 30% as compared to other colleges or schools of design. That's quite an accomplishment during downtime. The college has outreach programs in China, Europe, and South America. I have to tell you this story for what is it worth. Three years ago, I went to China for my third trip, third or fourth trip to China. This time my wife was with me. And we were in Shanghai in Podang, the business district, and there was a design of the tallest building that is gonna come up in China, in Shanghai. So my wife and I said, it's so interesting, I got a picture of this, because they had a design on the board. The building hasn't started yet. I had no idea that two, three years later, I will be on a campus whose graduate is designing that building in China. This is what this college is all about. So as I complete my first year at LT, as LTU president, I'm continually gratified by the energy, enthusiasm, and commitment of our faculty, colleagues, and students, and our staff, many of whom I have worked with, traveled with them. LTU has a proud history, many of you know, from its establishment adjacent to Henry Ford's Model T plant. So I often consider, being a small historian, that history of Lawrence Tech is intertwined with the history of Detroit. Because Michigan was known for timber before it became known for automobiles. And it is automobiles that created the middle class when the whole South came here for $5 a day wages that Henry Ford created. And we were right there creating the best engineers and architects to the community. So even though we had bad times in the past, economically, in the nation, and certainly in Michigan, this college kept thriving, and it is emerging even stronger. And it is my pleasure to be part of this great institution and pay tribute to our colleagues who have made it so great. Ladies and gentlemen, you are in a treat for the lecture we have designed for you. Thank you very much. The event that you're experiencing is part of the Taubman Lecture Series at the College of Architecture and Design. And over the last three years, A. Alfred Taubman has been a big part of our lives. He taught a real estate development course here at Lawrence Tech and has made it possible for the college to put on one of the finest architecture and design lecture series in the entire country, featuring notable design leaders over the last several years like Raphael Vignoli, Eugene Cohn, Michael Graves, not to mention Mr. Taubman himself as a featured speaker. As many of you know, Mr. and Mrs. A. Alfred Taubman are internationally renowned art collectors. Over the next few days, they are sponsoring an exhibition of 17 items from their personal art collection. The exhibition will be open to the public starting this Saturday at the UTLC Gallery right down the hall from here. Um, and um, next Monday night, April 22nd, Rebecca Hart, assistant curator of the contemporary art, uh, of contemporary art uh, at the Detroit Institute of Arts, will deliver a lecture on the exhibition uh, at 6 p.m. in this very room. Uh, the lecture is uh, free and open to the public. Up oh, and I just I just went over my slide. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, 
there's also an item that is up for bid at the AIAS auction in, in the next room, and that auction will be open for 45 minutes after the lecture for anyone in the audience uh, that wants to go to it. Um, tomorrow night, Friday night, at 6 p.m., there will be an exclusive invitation only opening reception to celebrate the selections from the collection of Mr. and Mrs. A. Alfred Taubman, their exhibition. And uh, Mr. Taubman will be there, uh, will make some remarks, uh, and, um, and it, it's, it's one of the hardest to get tickets uh, in, in, in the city. Uh, so there are two tickets available and they're up for bid. It's under, I think, Taubman Art Exhibit, uh, th that particular item. And I just checked, it doesn't have a single bid on it yet. And I'm, I'm going to bid on it if you don't, okay? Um, so, uh, attend, be part of this uh, action on Friday night, as well as support a worthy cause, which we'll hear about in a minute. Bids on this item and other items, again, will continue to be taken afterwards, uh, after the lecture. And everyone here can participate, whether you bought a ticket or not. So. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, someone to talk about the AIAS and, and their auction tonight. Uh, each year, Lawrence Tech's chapter of the American Institute of Architecture students hosts an auction and a reception to benefit their work on freedom by design as well as other AIAS programs. I would like to now ask uh, Megan Meg uh, Markowitz, a junior student in architecture, uh, here at Lawrence Tech and this year's chair of the auction committee to come forward and talk about the AIAS and the Freedom by Design program. Megan? Thank you. First, I'd like to thank everybody who attended the auction, everyone who donated to the auction, and my awesome auction committee that I had this year. Um, thank you, everyone. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about what exactly you're donating to and what exactly we do. So this is the Freedom by Design program and it's within the AIAS chapter, the American Institute of Architecture Students. And what the Freedom by Design program is, is it's a community service based program that's focused on helping people in the community with accessibility issues. For example, a ramp. This project that I'm showing here is the Common Ground Sanctuary. We renovated a kitchen over the summer, I believe it was last summer. And this was for a young woman's home. And now they have full access to their pantry and it's, it was a much needed change for, for the home. I also wanted to show you what AIS does apart from the Freedom by Design. Um, the goal of AIS is to really get the students out there into the profession and to interact with what they will be one day doing. So here are some pictures um, we hosted a Beaux-Arts Ball at the Fox Theater. We also hosted Midwest Quad, where we brought in about 300 students from around the Midwest. <coughs> and we also attended the AIA Michigan Retreat, which I'm sure some of you have attended as well. And that's all I have. <laughs> it is a very worthwhile organization, and the students work very hard at these events. So please auction afterwards. That's how they make their money. Um, with that said, uh, how many of you want to hear Tom Main speak? <laughs> okay. Little brief introduction, Tom Main, FAIA, founded Morph Morphosis as an interdisciplinary and collective practice involved in experimental design and research in 1972. Mr. Main is a co-founder of the Southern California Institute of Architecture and a distinguished professor at UCLA Architecture and Urban Design. His distinguished honors include the Prixter Prize in 2005 and the American Institute of Architects Gold Medal in 2013. He was appointed to the President's Committee on the, uh, on the Arts and the Humanities in 2009. With Morphosis, Tom Main has received 25 Progressive Architecture Awards and over 100 American Institute of Architects Awards and numerous other design recognitions. The works have been ex uh, published extensively and the firm has been the subject of numerous exhibitions and 25 monographs. So let us welcome tonight's speaker, Tom Main, FAIA. Am 
Am I mic'd? Can you hear me? Is it yes? The, um, nice to be here tonight with such a lovely, huge crowd here. <laughs> Just, um, let me, I've uh, put together uh, quite a few images, and I'm, I'm not um, interested this evening of really explaining project by project, but connecting um, a decade and a half's work uh, and um, looking at the, uh, the meta project. You're coming down to do my mic, right? Because it's not working. I knew that. So you don't want to use this. It's working, but it's not working. It's work, so it's not working. <laughs> okay. Is that better? Should I start over? <laughs> Just the, um, I'm going to go through a, a large series of work, and I'm going to try to make a connected tissue that has to do with the, the interests of, um, that have propelled us um, for the last couple decades. And, and I don't know where you are. A young man just minutes ago asked me, um, kind of where do your ideas come from? How do you start? I'm, I'm struggling with just like, where's the first thing come from? And I go, oh dear, um, you um, steal it. <laughs> <laughs> you take it from somebody. Um, when you were a year and a half or two years old, you didn't discover language. It was goo goo gaga, da da mama, and I kept going, right? And, and pretty soon you had sentence structure. And, um, and like everybody, um, I did the same thing, like all architects, right? You become preoccupied with certain things. And that leads me to an introduction because I came out of the late 60s. And um, modernism as an idea was um, somewhat deteriorating. It was exhausted, let's say, in the third generation. And uh, there was a series of challenges started by Robert Venturi and Complexity and Contradiction who made a very, very clear kind of articulate discussion of, its, um, of a counter argument. And um, it was, it's, I just happened to arrive at that time, and at the same, simultaneous to that, I was at USC, undergraduate, um, there was an interest in um, the very beginning of computation and um, systems analysis and broad ecological thinking that came out of, uh, with me, it was Ralph Knowles at USC, and it was McCarg, and it was uh, Christopher, Christopher Alexander at Berkeley. And um, we were kind of lost. And then the last year, I had kind of classical architects, Pierre Koenig and Craig Elwood, and extremely, extremely good architects, and we just ripped them apart. Had no interest in the kind of convention of that. It took me years later to realize that I'd studied under some extremely interesting people, but didn't um, kind of pick up much from that group. <laughs> well, the beginning of this, several things happened. Um, uh, Archigram was just publishing their first comic books, and it's where I got my name. Morphosis is a collective, and it was um, when you're 26, seven years old, you're just operating on instinct, so wherever that student is, the same thing. Don't worry about it, just go with your kind of sense, because you, you really don't know. You just, that's all you have is instinct. And, um, but the sense was that um, there was something in the air, and the notion of singularity of architect drawing the line, being the kind of a singular artistic hero didn't make sense anymore. And it seemed like architecture, especially like film, was a collective act. Out of that came morphosis and came an idea of um, a collective practice. Um, and so that my role is much more of a, um, let's say, a thought leader, as a broader sense of the word, than just a designer, right? And I'm, I've got some of my people here today, and I don't know, they'll tell you what they think, but it, it's, it, it's both, of course. You, sometimes you're very kind of personal and you, you, you enter it, and other times you're setting, you're talking about ideas, and it's an absolute conversation. And that was very much, again, part of this time. When you start architecture, um, what I'm not showing, which would start with Rizzoli 1, it'd be the first two decades, you students, um, slow food. Two decades, you're just tuning up, and you're finding your voice and you're determining some sort of a program, a meta project, let's say. Let's say. And um, you're developing um, a language which comes out of a response of your interest in what, uh, how you look at architecture, and it's establishing a voice, kind of who you are as, a, as a, your interest. And um, with me, I forgot who told me. I was told several times to talk about drawings. Um, Architecture, in a way, is only drawing. It's um, drawing is thinking. Um, I could stop now and show you all the slides without one word, and it'd be totally okay with me. I have everything I have to say is in the work, right? Nobody explains work. 
It's, it, it, it's already embedded with every bit of intelligence, emotional energy, everything that we have to say is found in the work, right? And it comes through um, processes, and the processes are embedded in the way we, we think through conceiving things through drawings, and it's moved from mechanical drawings to the computation and dig the digital world, which has just ramped up that whole kind of thinking. And it's, um, we interrogate, we analyze, we think of the thing that we're putting together, and it's tested with multiple kind of forces. Well, that's, that's also part of um, an interest then, because you're gonna see that um, literally everything I've done is interested in, in an architecture which responds to an urban condition. Um, buildings, cities are built accretionally, building at a time. And um, when we're producing work, we're part of that city making and it's impossible for me to think of, of, of architecture that isn't somehow contributing at an urban level in terms of the broader infrastructure, networking, et cetera, and uh, contributing to the nature of that urban environment. And um, out of that came um, certain interests, preoccupations that are the glue, I think, of, of, of our work. Um, one has to do with complexity, and there's been a lot of discussion of that, less maybe recently. Um, I'm not interested in complexity as an, as an ideological or as a separate thing. Complexity is just what exists. It's the nature of the world. And um, if you're reading uh, Joyce Finnegan's Wake, it, he was just looking out the window and was looking at what it looked like that other people cacophony, and he was looking at a different organization of how the world exists and its incredibly complex form. And with that comes um, conflict. And I've been fascinated with the relationship of um, the conflictual nature of what it means to be a human being today, that as you look at any numbers of kind of territories that just don't line up, and you're constantly putting together those conflictual territories, whether it's in a really simple term of programming and the most the mundane kind of part of architecture, or whether it's in a broader cultural, political, economic um, kind of ideas that um, we essentially deal with in conflict, and I celebrate that. I'm completely fascinated with that. And the work, I think, still shows its relationship to the, um, the struggle. Um, Lebius Woods uh, just died last year, a good, good friend, and somebody that had a huge influence on me. We, we had talked our whole year, and he talks about um, architecture of resistance and an architecture of complexity. And, and, and when you look at his drawings, you can literally see his struggle as an artist thinking as a thinker, right? And I'm really interested in that. And if I'm successful or not, I hope our buildings talk about that. They're not finished. They have no notion of completion. Um, we make no claim of finally solving something. We're just entering the problem and doing the best we can to talk about it. But in many cases, it's much less about a solution than it is investigating the issues and the problems that, that we face in today's society. And there couldn't be a more uh, vibrant time than this exact moment when both um, conversation is in the crisis, I would say, the conversation in this country right now is the problem with the conversation, with the dialogue, right, which doesn't happen at this moment in our political realm, and or it's extremely difficult, let's say, and, um, and the kind of differences that are taking place in this very broad, incredibly uh, complex, pluralistic, heterogeneous, diverse culture that we call the US of A. And, um, you would somehow have to honor that diversity and that conflict to understand that that's, that's the essence of our culture. And I see um, architecture can only be a political act. Maybe that'll come up in questions. I'm kind of amazed with, you tell me, when I talk to most students and ask if they think architecture is political, I get either a blank look or nothing, and then we have something to talk about, because architecture can only be political. There's no such thing as an apolitical architecture. It, meaning it's based in values. And there's no way of escaping um, because you produce the thing and it's material, so you have to live with it, right? And in today's world, um, whether it's tectonic, whether it's ecological, whether it's a social purpose, it's, it's connection to culture at many levels, it's relationship to economics, no matter where you go, you're, you're making a statement and it's a political statement. Um, finally, um, it's specific, and that'll be maybe the most evident in the work I'm showing, and that I'm interested in the specificity of the urban condition, and each work attempts to define and locate its own problem. And that would be maybe the, the key to um, kind of a never-ending generative material, is that at some point 
you're, you're, the, the discussion in any art form is you run out of the generative stuff that produces the work. And architecture is so amazing because it keeps bringing new material, even if you have a, a singular or, or a, somehow there's a limit to the organizational idea that you can bring into the project that is constantly challenged. And it, uh, it produces new material out of the specificity of the thing you're, you're looking at, whether it's program or the site, whether it's the culture of the city, et cetera, et cetera. And it's um, extremely um, useful um, as, a, um, a creative, as, a, as a part of the creative process that allows for that generation. And again, going back to the, the student with the first comment about where the work comes from, um, it's the result of a series of forces. And you choose the forces you're interested in. Right, that start that process of thinking of which you interpret into an idea, uh, a physical plan, an organization, a coherency, right, into a piece of architecture that, that begins to work and it's, um, it's to finally finds its way back to those values of which you're interested in, all right? Okay, um, I've loosely connected um, tonight's talk into five parts. First is, um, work which is uh, constraint driven, definitely connected to its urban environment, um, somewhat iconic in the sense that it's kind of classical that way in terms of buildings that have um, an iconic nature. Um, uh, the, the, the second one shifts into an architecture coming from landscape, urban but um, in its thinking, but it comes from um, a very different thinking of the role of landscape. Uh, the next one has to do with architecture, which is moving more and more into an urbanistic profile, which should end in the book that I was signing today that I'm not talking about. The next one is a series of current projects that I'm going to go like this, and the last one will be the project that we're working at, the beginning, the very, very beginning of the project that we're working at at, 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 um, at your institution. Um, I'm starting with really kind of the first real projects. Um, so this is mid-90s. and. Um, Again, I'm gonna, I'm, I see a lot of people that are not students <laughs> in profession, but I'm gonna speak to the, the students, that's what I'm here for. Um, after you've kind of mucked around for 20 years, and you're kind of now just about ready to start like real projects, meaning it, at least have, it has to have at least one elevator in it. Um, <laughs> it's funny, we had, I had jokes with um, people, my contemporaries, uh, Todd and Billy and, and, and uh, Stephen Hall and Wolf Fricks and Coopie Blau. When we were uh, 44, 45, we still couldn't get arrested to get a piece of work. And, uh, and we were complaining, and but we would always talk about our latest project. And finally, we made a deal. We, couldn't, we weren't even allowed to talk about the project if it didn't have an elevator. We were done with the residential and the cafes and all that kind of stuff. And um, that's what you, um, you have to prove yourself. Yeah? And you'll be 45 to 50, closer to 50, when you get your first kind of real piece of work if you're um, practicing solo if you're not with a, a larger group. Um, so we start, and here we are in an absolute cacophony of typical of Toronto, an environment that I absolutely love. And the building is a, a series of pieces, and it engages the street. And it literally engages the street. You, you, the, the public and private are seeing a single thing. The zero is kind of a joke. You see it from two kilometers down. It's the middle of the highway, and it's the, it's the boundary. The, the program asks for a gateway into the campus, and it was very literally that. And then um, in LA, not too long after that, we won the competition for the Caltrans building. And it's a, um, coming now from a series of forces, it's facing west, and it was the beginning of uh, our double facade system and looking at environment. And at this point, we were moving a bit more strategic, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We were shifting from designers to seeing things within tactical, strategic terms. And, uh, but it, it had this double scan. It was producing an open space. It has um, cultural gestures of the Hollywood sign of the two-dimensionality. We were trying to, to, to deal with the, uh, the things that are obvious to Los Angeles in, in the vernacular. Um, it had a piece of sculpture by Keith Yanier, which we completely embedded in the building. It's, um, it's, it's 100 meters long, the largest piece of light sculpture he did, and the largest one in LA. And it has landscape elements, which were actually for security. I wanted it to disappear, and I just started talking about security, trying to make it absolutely um, invisible. And then this piece of infrastructure that came out with the 100 sign is, um, it's the symbol of, of, of the group of people that make freeways, that make infrastructure. We left it raw, and we left it infrastructural, and we activated it with, with the human being. And then, um, just about simultaneous, um, we were, and, hmm. 
I'm the confused one in the group. A priori, a little bit. Can't remember quite where this came in. We're already talking to the engineers. Already knew it was thin. Already, we, we're gonna, I'm missing a thing. It's supposed to. The building should be down here, and we lift, pulled it up um, because we're about to take the air conditioning out of a, a, a tower. And um, drawing. Brandon, am I the only one with a pencil in the office? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> if I go to a desk, I got to come with my own Eagle 314. Only, pen, only pencil I've ever used my whole life, Eagle 314. You can't even buy them anymore. I find people that now copy them. And, um, and that's, I'm not sure it's good or bad news. I'm just cusp. You guys all use computer. I hope I don't get in trouble for this. You don't have to draw. You don't even have to own a pencil. It's three generations back. I am, but I'm an old man. Yeah? And so we built this thing, and um, something took place that was extremely interesting. Um, this is the building that changed my practice hugely, and um, we'd won the competition. And before we even were finishing signing the contract, there were all kinds of articles in the San Francisco papers. Can I use the word fuck here? There are all kinds of articles saying uh, bad boy Tom Main, uh, radical office morphosis coming up to our city. And the, you know the San Francisco LA has always had this thing. Anyway, and they're going to fuck up our city and da da da. I sat down, um, I was with um, uh, John Enright, who's um, now heads up uh, the undergraduate program at CIRC. And it was really interesting. We were like going, um, wait a minute, we have to approach this in a completely different way. We are no longer uh, architects that, that are seen as just designers. We have to think in broad terms. And we decided early on that this building would have, um, could contribute to the urban public space in San Francisco. It would be, um, it would look at the rethinking the work environment of, 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 a, of a large inner, uh, intergovernmental building, and it'd be, um, it would be highly efficient in terms of resources, in terms of sustainability. And we knew we'd be in alignment with the liberal city of San Francisco on all three of those issues, and we'll never talk about aesthetic. And ended up being an extremely useful strategy that allowed us to do this thing. And um, there's a Vest Park, Park, San Francisco, on the 11th floor that you can look at the, the water on one side and the city on the other. The lower piece, instead of a gallery, is a, a children's daycare center. 55% of the, the workforce is women. A big chunk of those have kids. They can come down on their breaks and lunch and be with their kids. And on and on, we took the cafe on the corner, this guy, and they're usually inside these huge, huge office complexes, and we pull people outside in the plaza that work there, and um, really, really went to work. And then the aesthetics didn't say a word. It has a very formal workspace. It's, it's right across from the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the Circuit of Appeals Court in San Francisco, 12th Circuit of Seals, a really famous building, and it's connected to a very known structure. And we made this very, very um, kind of monumental, it's the US of A, it's the, it's the, it's the largest federal building in the States, and we wanted a, um, an elegance, a presence, that when people work there, they understand the nature of this building versus another typical building. And then we completely change the social structure. You get off uh, every three floors, and there's tea rooms and meeting rooms and non-program space. And um, the pieces that stick out here, those are, again, everything is secondary meeting spaces. And uh, you're sitting on glass, and you're, in, you're floating in the public space. You're conceptually in the public space. And then we, um, we brought air through the building and we have a concrete mass of a ceiling, and we brought, we changed the program. So everybody thinks about this building as an energy neutral, not energy neutral, but a, but a non-air conditioned building. What really happened is we had to move the offices, the executive offices from the outside to the inside, and give the staff on the outside, and that was a huge, huge shift that they had to buy, right? And, um, and then these double skins that, that take off half the, the solar load of the building, and then on the north side, a, um, the fins that guide air through it. And essentially, um, if you look at the little diagram, um, we can power um, 650 homes out of the delta of this building. And then um, pursuing some of those ideas, uh, a competition that um, we, we, we won five years ago, and it's waiting for an economic shift right now in Paris, is the FAR building. And it's um, FAR is the, the second place winner from the Eiffel Tower, is where the name came from. And it's just a couple centimeters shorter than the Eiffel Tower, which is part of the Paris thing, which is this. And then again, um, oh, what do you want to talk about this? We could now talk about, go to drawing and say, mm, we don't really draw anymore. We make things in 3D. There is no drawing. We're just, and here they are, and this is like one a day, maybe two or three a day, right? Um, model, three hours, uh, Z Corp, 
right? Um, look at it, draw it, challenge it, program, uh, site condition, on and on, right? Next one, and we keep going through this, this process. And, um, and then it ends up being this finally, and a final model. And now we're looking at it within incredibly precise terms. And the model for us has always been the tool of understanding that all the tectonic and the, the nature of how things work spatially, et cetera. And so here we are um, in, in a lot of fonts. You're looking through the, what becomes the Champs-Élysées to Paris, about seven kilometers away. Um, obviously the tallest building in Paris and a um, kind of very unusual building, which um, is not extruded. Once you get away from the plan, and again, I would tell you that I think um, planometric, the basic notion of how we made architecture for 1,500 years is gone. The plan is no longer the, the main substantial drawing that you work from. You work from a 3D diagram of which the plan is now a CAT scan. And it's funny, I, we only had the computer, this is probably 20 years ago, and we realized already there was no really any longer a, a plan in a section. They're CAT scans. There's a, there's a horizontal and a vertical cut. Right, and they're more or less free because you just you can cut them any way you want them. And we were already kind of doing that by hand way back, anyway. And then here it is, and we're again urban in an urban construct. So as you move around the building, it's actually a complex of four things that tries to solve the very complex urban situation. A lot of fonts, which is an example of um, kind of bad 60s planning for everybody. And but when you look at it, it keeps changing. So now one building leans on the other, and it's actually clearly kind of two things. In other cases, you see the kind of the seamless form, et cetera. And uh, as you, if you're in different positions, instead of the extrusion that comes out of a plan, you're constantly getting recomposed things. It, re, it um, re-challenges you to understand what it is. And then it had this incredibly interesting non-site that um, couldn't have been better for us. I love problems that start with impossibilities. That's another way, by the way, where ideas come from. Um, take something which is, it seems to be totally impossible, and that gives you a huge opportunities. Because this building um, doesn't come from a, a, an artistic sculptural idea. It's absolutely completely resolving the difficulty of the site. Otherwise, we would never could have done this. And so here we are. And it's this funny sliver between the outside ring road and the the uh, the knit, and it's got a hole in it, a 30 meter hole that connects the, the, this um, the. Uh, the pedestrian walk that connects to the university at, uh, at Cobovois. And, um, and then it has this very complex connective tissue coming off the, uh, the metro. Um, 10,000 people enter this building in, in um, just under an hour. And it had very much to do with the public space. And then um, the plan continually changes. No floor is the same as it comes up. And then the section um, gives us this very unusual public space. This guy, it's um, 20 stories tall. Um, that's the entry space, and it's still seen as part of the public. And you're coming out of the subway, and you're coming through the escalator up to eight floors. Um, we're still in the public realm. And then there's the space, and in some ways we interiorize the Eiffel Tower. We use some of the kind of thinking. And then, like San Francisco, now it, the sun traces east, south, west, with the double skin, and it gives us a super, super efficient building. And here's the skin. It's made out of uh, oh, 5,000, 6,000 individual pieces. This is the prototype of that. This is the system. We're scripting now another whole conversation. That'd be a separate lecture just on, scoop, just on scripting. Um, you're, you're developing performances, and the design comes out of the, right, the, the performances, the, the criterion. And, um, and again, the Eiffel Tower, and then the lighting is going to be, um, in a way, a drawing of the, the idea in the most lyrical sense, because we're trying to match now lyricism and um, performance. They're not separate things. They work together, right? And um, it really irks me when, when people make a division of it can either be functional and performance-driven or artistic and lyrical, and it's absolutely absurd. Architecture is the, is the intersection of those two things. It's exactly what it is. And then, um, probably one of the most interesting projects we ever did, we, we won a competition for the, with the GSA for the Eugene Courthouse. And um, Judge Michael Hogan was not completely thrilled that we won it, and um, immediately took me to Washington to look at the Supreme Court as if I'd never seen it. And um, 
I had to tell him that actually what he didn't know is that Cal Scobert, it's a completely modern steel frame, of course, and et cetera, et cetera. And it's an absolutely absurd building in terms of classical sense. It's, just, it's, it's been just kind of glued together with different ideas. And it's a culture that doesn't have an architecture yet. And we borrowed from, from um, our European kind of roots. And uh, we gave him this. And uh, uh, it was a, uh, this was an act of love. Um, it was a year to go through our, our tutoring. And um, I took him to Europe and it was a fantastic, again, just one of these really great growing kind of experiences. Um, I, I took him to um, Nantes to look at uh, Nouvelle and I took him to Bordeaux to see uh, Richard Rogers in the courthouses. And it wasn't the architecture. Look at these two buildings in terms of the architecture. It was the status of the architect. Because in Europe, you can actually do something and you have power as an architect, not like this country, right? where you're the beholden, you're produce, producing a service, and I am super, super anti-service. That's not what I'm interested in, right? I would have been, I would have, I would be a waiter or a slave if I wanted to do that, not interested in doing that, right? And uh, uh, we spent, and when I took him there, it was, it was the complete shift of our relationship. And um, Rogers, he didn't care for it, too mechanical, and blah, 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 the courtrooms, if you know them, those the really beautiful wooden courtrooms are absolutely amazing. And then we went to, um, to um, Nouvelle and Nantes, and he just went nutty, because it's really cynical. I don't know if you know, the red courtrooms, they're lit with really blue fluorescent lights, and he walked in with his counterpart, the judge that was the chief justice of, of Nantes, and he screamed out, guilty as charged. <laughs> and it was really hilarious. And then we came back, and luckily we share a love for Bordeaux wine. That helped us a lot, <laughs> drinking as much as possible at all times. And um, he, um, it completely changed him. He now understood the, um, what we were talking about in terms of the relationship between an architect and a client. And it was much more engaged, that we both get to have a voice. We both have um, an idea of what it is. And of course, with that, we were um, a bit politically on different sides, and we had to work on that one out, because he's much more of a, of a constitutionalist, and it's more fixed, and I'm much more interested in open-ended stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the, the, the idea, here it is, and uh, we had to show a logic. And again, this is probably one of the hardest things with dealing with clients, because they, I think the, the public just sees architecture in fairly literal terms that responds to very straightforward functions. And of course, it operates on extremely abstract terms, and we, I had to take him into a logic because was, it was not possible studying jurisprudence and his education that's based on case law to work without logic. And I used the Dow notion of fishing. He's a fisherman. And so, okay, I'll, I'll use this fishing. And we threw a line. I used a, it came out of a drawing. You throw a line. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's, a use, it's used for a, a proof of, um, of randomness. And, um, but you can actually, you can can't anticipate where these things will go, but they happen in a very complex order. And then I drew that and made the circulation around it, and it actually worked. He understood. He said, okay, I, this is, you're in a different field than I am, and you were operating in very, very different terms, that, uh, and your ideas are much broader in terms of the location, because as you know, it can come from anywhere, an idea. It's, it's irrelevant, right? It's sooner or later, it's going to be shaped by all the uh, confining notions, that, that, that gravity, it can't leak, program, on and on, movement, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not a problem. And um, it was this very flowing kind of piece, this, this set of surfaces, which was open-ended and continuous. And, um, but it was loaded with tradition. It's piano nobly. Um, you'll see the courthouse in a minute. It's a processional, et cetera. And we borrowed a huge amount of stuff from existing court, courthouses, but it's dynamic. And um, as you're moving through, um, you're looking at court five, and then you move in the court, and the court we spent a year with, it's incredibly nuanced. We took the jury um, to the one edge. We spent a lot of time, um, most of them are just rooms. We can reconfigure it and kind of position the judge, and now we're having a good time. I'm playing, he's kind of playing, and I'm focusing on him, because he's, the judge, is, uh, the, 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 that's the third, uh, the, the sort of segment of our government, it's the, it's the most um, connected to the British system still. They wear the robe, you stand up on the end of the room, right? It's the most formalized. And we were, we, were, we were playing on that, and we brought the space into him, put a light over him, and then put this light, and he got the light immediately. It's a guillotine. And, um, and it defies defense and prosecution, 
and and then on the side is the jury, and we wanted them like theater. They're they're connected and not connected, right? They're looking in the procedure, and we we spent huge time. And then the chairs are um, Puritan, straight up. You have to dress. You can't go in with. You have to dress properly. He was very interested in that, and it should be. And you sit, and you're not totally comfortable, and it's purposeful. We spent um, months. Redoing, redoing the chair, so it was just perfect, and it had to do with the, the broad notion of the American court over history, et cetera, et cetera. And when you saw the courthouse, the whole thing made sense, because you realize the construct is nothing more but the shaping of the six courtrooms. And then um, Cooper Union, um, really interesting project, a school that had a huge influence on me that we were using as a model for CIRC in 72 when Haydick was running it. and. Um, some interest in purposely developing something very idiosyncratic and kind of specific and high energy and the opposite of the foundation building that, that's next to it. It's a square block, which is, there's only about three of these in, in New York, a very, very small block. And um, just an incredible opportunity working for a, uh, an institution that, that produces architects, engineers, and artists. And um, the skin is now much more about a shaping exercise of an envelope, because the envelope came. We had nothing to do with the envelope. The size of the building came. And um, the connection of histories, because I would say this building is very, very much contextual. And again, it gets much more complicated, not the way it looks, of course. This is a building that built 150 years after the, the foundation building. It's contextual if you look at the nature of its construction and its toughness connected to the east side of New York. If you know the east side, it's a very tough kind of place. And the community got it right away. Um, construction concrete, rough, not architectural concrete. Um, and the publicness, um, the stair comes in and it's actually part of the sidewalk and moves up and it's a social space, I'll show you in a minute. And the, um, the whole ground floor is open and part of the community. And it's, it stitches together the social functions. And the stair is uh, the Met, it's the, uh, the New York Library, it's a social space, it's part of the street. What you don't see is you look up, you look all the way out of the, there's a window, and you're out in the city again. So you're never kind of in it. You walk in and you go up the stairs and you're looking right out again. So you're always connected to the city which was absolutely fundamental in the uh, social pedagogy of the school, because they see themselves as um, very much connected to the uh, intellectual creative capital of their investment in a school, right, as part of New York. And that's all New York is, is this incredible intensity of creative capital. And now, a um, piece of the construction over here, a um, person in my office worked a year on this thing, invented it, built it uh, for a very, very um, tough budget. And um, we're now making things that we can't draw. There's absolutely no reason to even think about drawing. Um, they can only be constructed in a 3D environment, and they can only be resolved technically in a 3D environment. And so the, the pipe over there that's holding these pieces, um, every piece comes out of our studio, right? Every element goes to the shop, and we're, um, we're building it. We're back in the Middle Ages. We're, we're architect builders. We're constructing things. And um, it allows us to put together very um, kind of eccentric shapes that are really unique. They're not repetitive, and you've never seen them before. And uh, it allows us to do this. And again, we're stopping at only two stops. Um, and that's where the social spaces are. We're borrowing from San Francisco at that level. And you're looking at these groups of stairs, and they become lights at, at night. And um, everything in here is unique. And it's. Um, it's how you can build today. There's absolutely no reason for repetition. And then just recently, God, I forget. This is a crystal, a little thing there. That is actually not, that is found and is produced in that method, the crystal. And I forget its name. Brandon, you know the one? No. You don't know either? Are you going to get pissed off as I'm, I'm asking you questions? <laughs> <laughs> Brandon said, don't talk to me when you lecture. I hate that. Um, and so here we are. I'm, I'm drawing kind of over stuff. Or I, have no, I can't remember quite. And it's, it's the landscape of, that's going to support this piece. And here it is. Right? And it's going to be back and forth in terms of a very... The thing about drawing still, it's so fast. And you can work at, so, at speed of light. And, um, and then here's, here's a, a plan on the landscape. And here it is. And now it's going to be a transition to something. It's building an, a ground element. And we're making the site. 
I didn't mention that at Paris, but we actually built the site. That's what we did. We had to construct the site. And again, you don't think of that. You think of the build, putting a building on a site and the site's passive. And we got interested a long time ago. No, 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 the site's active. And you construct the site and the building at the same time. So here we are in this kind of very odd kind of LA construct. And um, a, um, typical of, of a Los Angeles thing in Dallas. There's some similar cities. And um, the kind of sexual relationship. And now here we go again. Um, a few of the hundreds and hundreds of the models that, that came out of this, the process that made this building. And then um, here we are, and it's a um, very, very simple um, cube sitting on top of this landscape. And it's um, purposely contrasting with the modern, mostly commercial towers. The concrete was very purposeful. And it needed to be very isolated and, and monolithic and singular as an idea. And it was also part of a cost model um, built through very, very low budget. And then we took the escalator, the movement. It's uh, borrowing from, I don't know, Pompidou, or the sequence would be um, right at Guggenheim. But you're moving out of the building instead of in. So you, you get on the lift, and you're moving towards the city. And again, we're continually interested in the, the relationship of the interior functions of the exhibits and its connection to the city, not as an isolated thing. You always belong to the, um, the urban environment. And then here's this new landscape. It's built out of indigenous materials, indigenous stone and, and, um, and plant materials that are part of this environment if you were left neutral. And we invented the skin. And I'm not sure I'm going to show, maybe not. Um, we made that. We made the forms. We worked with Gates Construction in Dallas. And um, I'm missing, I have another lecture that's a for a different direction. They advertised this six months before the building was finished. They had a full page ad advertising it. My wife, who's a business person, says, Tom, of course you have a, uh, a license on that and a royalty. And I said, well, no, not actually. And, um, but again, it's a discussion that goes back to the, 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 the making, construction, drawing, modeling, et cetera, that today it's more and more engaged. And it's an economic necessity because we built this for $50 a square foot. It's an incredibly, incredibly, this is a, this is a target store. And, and it's a set, a set on random, random conditions, and um, we produced it. The main lobby, and then it really it looks solid, but it's incredibly open. You go to the lobby, and you get a 360-degree view of the city. And then these elements, which can become part of the roofscape, which are part of a landscape, a lyrical landscape that you're going to find in the garden. And then this 170-foot vertical public space beginning sequence out of the lobby. And again, um, the concrete, um, some of it quite simple, but some of it actually very, very complex, right, is its shapes. This is all precast. And again, everywhere, you're going to be connected to the nature of, of the city of Dallas, the outside world. And then the whole conversation was transparency, conversation, connection, and um, everywhere um, the, the human character animates the building. And you're aware of the other people in the building, and it becomes extremely important as a part of the program. And um, there's three elevators in a row, and you're looking through, and depend, it's like a roulette machine, depending on the conditions, you can get them all lining up, or different conditions lining up. And um, it's... Um, the building was seen as an exhibit, and it's something that uh, animates the, the users that, that um, occupy it. And it has to be um, kind of understood like that. OK, um, part two. Um, a shift where landscape becomes a, um, an ordering device or a primary concern with the work. And uh, we started from Mona. This was 92, 3, 4, 5 in there. Little piece on top, the drawing. That was the first image of the building, the 3D form. And we were interested in shaping the site as an idea. And it was going to be a broad notion of an ecological approach to building, where the building now becomes just site. And it goes away as an idea. And it becomes totally integrated. And, um, and then it went through a series of, of, we were just getting first computer. We just changed the office. and. Um, and now the model is working with Overup, and it's a model that is a technical model that has all the structure in MEP, right? And um, 
It's a complete different process. And then by the time we got to Cloggedford, just later, um, we're building a part of a city. I, was that a dog? <laughs> he liked the last project. <laughs> the, um, and we're, we're modeling. Yeah. Oh, this did I need to be uh, sorry. Okay. All right. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Closer. Just take it off. Just take it off. Oh no, no, I can't hold it. I'll get closer. Uh, like that? Oh dear. Has this been going on for a long time? That's okay. You just look at the pictures and it makes it easy, right? <laughs> Uh, I told you in the beginning, it probably doesn't matter if you listen or not, it's irrelevant. Um, well, now we're, we're, we're constructing, and these are our first drawings, right? And, and you look at them, and you, couldn't, you can't preconceive them, and you don't have the ability even to draw them anymore, right? You're putting pieces together in a way that the connections are not preconceivable. And this is the, 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 the Hoopa Bank in, in Austria. And this was also kind of extremely interesting, because this is our early, this is again, we're in the 90s. And this is the, the first shot we had in Europe, and it's a completely different world. This is for a very conservative country, a very, very conservative city. It's a bank, and this is what they expected. And they never talked, they never touched this, never discussed like, aesthetics. That's our job. We're architects. And it was, a, um, it was, a, a, it was very much a, about an urban, an urban project, and we're building a part of the city. And um, the, the, the uh, the environmental response, which is part of the European community already, we're just really following along now. Is this demanded of all these second skins, and the um, the diversity that's coming out of the interest we've had in terms of shaping buildings and making cities, where we're constantly looking at new conditions and it's not repetitive, and you just keep saying new things, but it's systematized, it's ordered, and um, pieces of history. We were using uh, Wagner's uh, Postal Savings Bank in Vienna as a model, but instead of a four-sided thing, it's a three-sided thing, and we're shifting from. A classical uh, that was built at the turn of the 19th and 20th, and we we're building this at the, just about at the beginning of the 21st. And everything's transparent, which is part of a again a, um, a social model, which is now prevalent, whether you're in the uh, commercial world or in the academic world. And um, and then uh, same client, and now we've added um, landscape, building, infrastructure, and the the road and the landscape the car all becomes singular, and we now see it building literally fragments of city where we're taking control of all the three major components of city between, again, landscape, infrastructure, and building. And um, building this new ground now, and you're hovering in this space between the ground and a new articulated ground, and it allows you to, to give very particular focus and to develop an orientation of how you move through the building because, of course, this is a horrible way to see something. Buildings have to be experienced. The slides are just giving you kind of memories of things. And it's all about sequence of movement, right? You have, you have to be there. And then um, you're looking at that space. And now the, the public space is absolutely geared to the total organization. And you understand that inside out and outside in. And um, we have a very simple way of organizing public and private. And then kind of the culmination of this work. Um, I showed these sides at the edge. This is a, a competition we did in Vienna in, in 85. And the white pieces are pieces of land. It's the first time we kind of articulated the idea of the site is program. So half the program was built in the site, and the rest of it was more traditional building. And this whole notion of active site, active building, and it changes forever. And then here we are many years later. And again, you're going to find that um, these things, you make them look more continuous than they are. You have an idea, and it won't come back to you for 15 years. You don't have an opportunity to actually have the, right, the piece of work, right? And it just kind of lingers, and an opportunity comes up. So here we have this, this campus for um, the giant group in, in Shanghai, in uh, Pudong. And um, we're making a piece of a city that crosses a highway. And um, it's made out of now of these components that we can control, that we've been working with now for 10 years or so. and. Um, we can look at the role of each of these subsystems, and we can um, evaluate how it works within the total system. Right? And um, we can 
find a, a way of making something very organized and coherent, but absolutely differentiated, more like a walk in a forest in nature than like a traditional building. So no matter where you are, there, it's always a different position, but it's absolutely organized. It's clear that it's coherent. And environmentally, it's a very different thing. We only have the building, traditional building is 13% of the, of the project. So it's a very, very different environmental model. And then it's, of course, all about section. Because going way back to the school, it's about the shaping of the land. And again, it gives us huge um, spatial opportunities in terms of defining um, differentiated spaces for different functions. And again, just little pieces of stuff, the drawings, the, the steel, um, every one of them is different, and we drew them all. It doesn't matter. Um, they were. I have no idea. 15, 25,000 individual discrete pieces. There were four mistakes. Right? And, um, and then the skin came from Switzerland, and there were no mistakes. And again, we're modeling. And now, um, <laughs> uh, she, is it he or she? Does he want to come over here and sit with me? <laughs> the, the initial drawing. The idea, the technical drawing, the model, the rendering, the building are one single thing, right? It's all coming out of the, the digital environment, and it's singular, right? There is no such thing as kind of schematic DV working drawings. It flows as a single thing. And then here it is. And again, it's this randomness of putting systems together, which is a, um, an interest in a territory between chance and willfulness that I'm going to end with. And for, for me, I, my guess would be for a lot of you, um, it's really interesting uh, working on a project that you can't yourself preconceive. So even when you walk through it, there's huge numbers of conditions that you never imagined that are just chance behaviors. And it's like building a Gothic town. And it's all the funny little spaces in between that are the most interesting. It's not the organized ones. Those are the ones that, OK, we get it. It's, it's the, the chances that happen. You go, oh. This is great, and, and right? And I'm fascinated with um, a way of producing those conditions. And then, of course, with landscape, you get some dynamicism. It changes. And the, um, the country and the city are now singular. And what's building, what's bridge, what's landscape are ambiguous. So the corridor, there's a walkway that goes the 400 meters, and sometimes it leaves the building, it comes out and is in the landscape and passes through a library, and then it crosses again. You saw another one that was a bridge that crossed into another landscape, and then there's these pieces in between that are just found things that we, we use as, as gardens, etc. And then it ends in another in a koi pond and in the water. And then again, these spaces in between. And then the piece coming out, that big nose, it cantilevers, um, ooh, what it weighs, uh, 60 meters, 180 feet. Um, again, it's, it's, uh, the architect will enjoy this. Uh, showed it to the client, and he said, did it go far enough? <laughs> I did that in a competition for Chicago. We didn't get it. It wasn't even this long. I was the first out. And I reminded them that they had uh, something like 40 bridges that moved that were building the first ascension. It didn't help me. It totally frightened him. He wants to go, should it go a little further? And I go, no, we're OK. And then here's that, that room, and we're above the lake. And it's the boardroom. The tea room and a, a social meeting space. Part of a gymnasium, and the, 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 the roof, the landscape now is kind of lifting off and letting light creep in. Part of the aquatic complex the entry to the housing and the hotel. These elements that are um, one of the pieces of systems that, that uh, contain mechanical systems and structure, but are just part of the language of the building. And then um, two projects, which go yet in a different direction, which are very much urbanistic and leading towards city planning. Um, a a low-cost housing, uh, workers' housing in Madrid, 
and we were looking at developing a complete new model, the buildings around it, the institutionalized pieces are, are, are housing, and we were looking at complete change in the model to something much lower scale, something that had gardens, open space for families that had the same density, and was using the, um, the Moorish model, of which this has, a, of course, a 200-year tradition, the Moors occupied um, uh, um, Madrid. And it's the COSBA. You're moving through in a very different organization. It was a really, really interesting project. $60 a square foot. And a, a, really thinking of re a residential type work versus the institutional nature of the, of the, of the block, which is so uh, detested. And then they all had courtyards, and you'd come up from below from your parking for the courtyards, and the courtyards had communities. And so we built, we built neighborhoods within these, these spaces. And then um, landscape was supposed to be on these pieces, and it kind of disappeared. And then um, Cincinnati, which is um, the most interesting, I think, successful um, urban project we've ever been involved with. And it was started by uh, uh, Jay Chatterjee, the, the dean of the school there. And um, it started with just the, uh, the, the reworking of the stadium. And then the first project was Peter Eisenman at, at DAC, the, the School of Architecture. And then right after that, a, um, an alumni center. And then Peter Graves built his engineering project. And then Cobb built the music school. <coughs> and um, the, the, piv the pavilion off the park, uh, I lost her name. Um, and then they brought in George Hardgraves, right there to there. And they said, OK, we're no longer interested in building icons. We were actually, a, a campus needs a connective tissue. And it was really, really interesting. And, and they took these buildings down that you just saw, uh, put the center in. And then uh, Charlie Guathamy reworked the um, student union. And uh, Moore Uri Odell worked on a, a, a services building on one side. And we built a, um, an academic uh, building on the other. And we're producing a, literally a street, a piece of Sean Jimmy Nana maybe, and um, a complete different discussion of glue. And then the, the, with that goes the athletic center, and then housing on top of that. And then Bernard Schumi came along and built the, the sports facility. And the whole thing has to do with it's, just, it's not a building anymore. It's, a, it's accumulation of pieces that make a city. There's no elevations, right? It's all about making space instead of making objects. Just an incredibly interesting project, an incredibly complex project. And by the time we got to this one, we had to be really far along in computation because it's an immensely um, difficult, um, uh, just the geometry of the connection of these various the uses were really complex. So here we are ending that. The housing is forming a gateway a la um, Toronto. We're coming up the street. Charlie is at the very end. All right? That's his, uh, the redo. And everything is about public space and connective tissue that's gluing the campus together from the, the old, the original square to the new quadrant. And these huge scale inside outside, which you can't see as you look through and you're looking through to other parts of the campus, the football stadium, big expanses of landscape, et cetera. This is the track. This is a piece that connects through our complex to our housing. And um, I was interested in establishing like the differences I've been talking about, different moods. Some things are somber and kind of quiet and other things are bright and lively. And we had a lot of discussion about this because it, again, um, I think maybe more in this country, everybody wants everything cheerful. And I go, no, it'd be, it, would you do that with a film or a novel or? No, some places in the city that are most interesting are, are somehow chilling or have a different feeling or a somber. Or, or, you, you want that differentiation of what's, what, what makes really interesting cities. And then again, this connection of things, which is um, endemic for all our work. And then just really quickly, I have no idea. I didn't turn my timer on. My clock ran out of juice on the way over here when I was on the plane. I haven't got my iPhone, so I'm dead. Just really quickly, some current projects that will give you an idea of what's happening. And, and I should say, um, there has been a huge shift in architecture since 08. Um, we're working abroad, just about um, solo. Um, we, um, obviously, in China quite a bit. Um, things are kind of operating much quicker. We're growing. The buildings are getting large. And it'd be a, maybe a discussion that somebody wants to have in the later part. Um, we won a competition a couple months ago for a 350-meter tower in Shenzhen. And um, it has a, um, a, where do you see it? a separate core from the building. It'll be the tallest building of this type in the world. Um, Richard Rogers has one in London. 
just completed, the needle building with the core coming out. Um, and so it's really interesting, the little bridge between, you're gonna be going from the core, the elevator core, into the thing across a bridge, and you're gonna be 70 stories, 80 stories in the air, and you're, you're, you're engaged in the city. It should be really, really fascinating. And then you, you come into these courtyards, these gardens, and every four pieces there's a garden and uh, an open space that's part of this assembly. And so there's the core and that space between with these uh, bridges. And then it's bending facade. Again, it's a dual skin. This is an old one. We already have a complete new skin now. It's going from solid to articulated as it goes up to the top. We'll um, actually, I'll be talking about that in the afternoon tomorrow as I return to LA. And again, this ground form that becomes the, the, the basis of a, a piece that moves up. It starts as a, it links to the ground and it produces this very large public space. We want it for that. They want, the Xinjiang is a city that's um, a very modern city and they're, they're desperately looking at how to rethink um, public space within these office environments. And then the, the core, which is gonna be quite unusual. And it's the, uh, there's a three level commercial core and uh, that leads you to the tower. And as you move towards the, the crevice, if you move this way, you're actually going to look underneath the space between, and you're going to see people. I think I've got it right here. You're going to see that. You see that space going up, um, well, 350 meters. <laughs> and you're seeing people walking on, and some of the, the first ones all have glass floors. And so you're going to be see people moving through as they look up. And then um, it's just taking us far and wide these days. We're working in Morocco and Casablanca. And do I have the slide I want? Uh, the little piece over here, uh, we got really interested in that. We were using the, uh, the, the Chrysler building. And it has a, a top and a bottom and a shaft. And so we, we just kind of took the top and swung it down and said that the building is three things. It's a ground piece, which you see, which has some qualities. It's the one that the human being touches, right, that engages with. There's the shaft, which is the money maker. It's just an economic aggregate. And there's a top, which is urban. And we just did this diagram. We just flipped it off. We, talk, we talked about it that way. And we kind of made a building that way, we made the top and the bottom more alike. And um, again, as you move it, it's going to be dynamic and it keeps changing. And again, um, there's many of these models. And I purposely showed the scale of this one. All right, because that's all we need at this point is an idea, all right? Not, we're at a competition, we just want the competition. We need nothing more than that. And then um, a building that's just getting close, uh, we're doing the computer sciences building in, in Ithaca for Cornell, and I'm really happy. This is the um, next uh, generation of our skins, and they're getting um, a little more complicated. And in this one, let me see if I, Nope, I mean, I'm gonna go back. I don't have the one I want. Shoot, this is a nicer one. But we're trying to do, it, it became apparent that um, uh, we use mirror glass because we're trying to double the effect of the dynamicism of the, of the wall. And if it's working, it looks like it is. It's not really mirror. You're seeing the backside of the same element and we designed it front and back. And we're just trying to get a super energetic three-dimensional skin, and it's actually performative. It's taking again. It's the it's the it's the 50% um, uh, uh, open um, uh, stainless steel, and it's transforming. It starts smooth, and then it 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 um, moves into a pattern. And then um, another project in Shenzhen, um, and we're what are we doing? <laughs> you have to change mindsets when you start working in China, and then we come in way too conflicted and too realistic. And as we work there more, we're going, wait a minute, we've well, got to get completely different uh, mind. We're, we're, we're um, not allowing ourselves to explore ideas that are absolutely buildable there that I couldn't possibly show a client in this country, and I've been trained for years working with just the GSAs and the public and the universities. And this one represents that. It's a much freer idea and it's much more lyrical. And, um, and it's part research, didn't win this. And um, didn't actually wanna win it, 
by the time we present it to the client, because this is a project where you have to have the right client. I have to have a, the, 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 uh, the Shanghai client, the giant project client, and I have to have somebody that, that, that's there lyrically. Although the first one which looks a little conservative, it's a great client, and he wants the lyricism of the bent face of that. And then we're doing a huge, huge project in um, Milan. Uh, we're just completing um, schematic design, and it's the center for ENI, um, the petroleum company, largest project in Italy right now. It's their campus, and it'll, you'll recognize it. It, has, it shares stuff that we've been working with for years. This urban, it makes a court. It's, it's about space making. And um, it's all about making public space, about continuing the city. And um, it's these layers, these, these forms that, that, that connect each other, and they're stratified. And we're using, it doesn't show here, we're using um, uh, maps, uh, ge uh, geological maps that show the stratification of, of Earth structure, where oil comes from. Right? And we're literally drawing that and using it as a very literal thing to make the, the symbol of, uh, of this piece of work. Okay, and then, okay, now you have to understand, I'm not apologizing, but we're in the very beginning. And when you begin, it's just what it is. And um, what's maybe evident in the work you looked at is that there's huge reiterations and it keeps going all the way through the project. And uh, so we have kind of the bigger kind of idea, and we're now really focused on um, we take something and we attack it. We interrogate it, all right? And out of that interrogation, it keeps moving, changing, until we feel we've, we've gotten something. And we're in the middle of that process right now. So I'm showing you uh, um, my underwear, <laughs> so to speak, all right? And um, here we are on your campus. And, um, and um, Here we are, here, right? Over there. And we, certain instincts, again, we're talking about a departure point, and um, it's going to be urban or campus, let's say, at this thing. And um, um, it even came out of our interview that the certain questions were asked, and I was very straightforward how I answered them, and I thought that um, certain things were over-designed and kind of cluttered. And I'm going, no, why don't you do less and something um, bigger scale and simpler because it, what it needs is some sort of an organizational idea. And we're starting with this, the, um, the, the new facility as this lineal piece, which is going to bridge the campus connected to the science and engineering building. And it's going to bridge into the, over the creek and the landscape and to the, to the field, to the top. And, um, and it's going to present a, um, a completion of the court of this guy, and it's going to be movement coming through, and it's going to be a gateway, and then of course the big, big parking lot, and it's going to, there's going to be a wall that comes all the way through, a low wall here, and there's going to be an event for the second entry, right? And it's, it's the simple kind of beginning of the project, and it's going to have um, a scale. Um, we'll talk about this later. That um, ooh, I haven't told anybody about this. Okay, I say these things. <laughs> I'm just winging it now, okay? So don't, don't anybody, um, I, I would have kept going. And, and it seems like, um, it started with, I'm missing a slide. And it's, it's Albert Kahn. And it's the one that Mies redrew. Next time I'm here, I'll come again. We're done with the building for sure. And, and we need that slide. Because um, you guys all know Albert Kahn because you're here. Um, I'm one of the few people that knows it's not, he's not among young people, a very well-known person. They know Louis and not Albert. And I happen to know Albert and have huge, huge respect for the work. And he, besides the fact that he was one of the most prolific architects in the history of mankind, uh, the amount of work he produced is just totally insane. But you look at these spaces and they were just absolutely amazing. And he was unique in doing industrial factory spaces, which is a great, great project type. And it's really weird, it kind of disappeared. You very, when's the last time in a magazine? You see in a workspace like a like a, a, an assembly line or something, and they're just phenomenal projects, and they should be right. And uh, but we like the scale of some singular piece that kind of organizes the campus, and it gives it, in my mind, a kind of stature. It's not a, a series of kind of smaller domestic scale, or mm, they're not domestic, but that it it has some a weight to it, and it's also quite simple, and it's also extremely flexible. Less is more in this case. You just need huge empty space 
and you're going to do whatever you want with it because programs today in architecture and engineering are um, continually changing. And you want as less obstacle possible to be able to do the things you want. And again, um, I'm still a board member at SciArc, and we have the same thing, just a really big, open, incredible space. And UCLA just got the Howard Hughes Hercules space, which is just amazing. I mean, it's totally, totally crazy. Did anybody know the, the, um, the Spruce Goose? It's, I'm just looking at the drawings again. It's crazy. It's plywood, right? It's just one of the most insane, it, it's, it's something that it's not possible it could be done. And that's why it makes it so interesting. You look at it, and this is not possible. It never flew, and they actually did get it a couple feet off the ground, right? And uh, anyway, the scale, the, the entrance sequence was, was critical, and, uh, and it set up a relationship with the landscape site to the right, and, um, which is the, one of the more beautiful. It, it just takes us to another area, which is a, a natural site condition. And um, here we are, and it's going to lift off the ground, and the, and the landscape will come underneath it, and it'll be a, a bridge, and um, just very, very straightforward. And then there's this the, the freeway, of course, we share this line. And I would think in the future it's very possible you would, you would redo the skin of the science and engineering building to become part of that, and it's going to be just one continuous piece. And um, it's at the scale of the freeway, and it's just one long, low thing. And then again, from the, from the court, you're coming across, it's opening up beneath, and again, it's the, it's the entry, I don't know, in terms of numbers of cars, probably the main entry, in terms of the, um, the campus. And here we are underneath it, and then now it, it pushes down, connecting to the auditorium, right? And there's a, spa a public space there, and there's these two light wells bringing in light to the space, and, um, and this object, and we're just now talking about it, you're gonna see it in a minute, the one, that thing, which is the stairway. Everybody moves by stair. There's no reason. There's an elevator for handicap, but there's no reason to use an elevator. You're just moving up two and going down one. And, um, and we're just looking at that, and it might be inflatable. It might be GFRG, a GFRC. It could be a fiberglass product. It could be um, um, carbon fiber. I heard you guys build stuff here. Is that true? My personal idea, again, I, I'm way winging it when I do these things, all right? So no, I haven't talked to anybody about these things. I would have you build the thing out of carbon fiber. I'm working with Greg Lynn right now, and he's, he's designing a boat, and it's an amazing material. He shows me his kid holding up big, huge pieces of the boat like this, and it weighs like a pound and a half. And it's just, I'm dying to use carbon fiber. It'd be, for a, a, an, an engineering architectural school, it'd be, that's exactly what you'd want to use. It weighs nothing, and all we want is an envelope around the stair. It's perfect, perfect material. It's about money, right? That's all it's about. And, but we're, we're looking at that piece because we have basically a very generic workspace is what you need, not architecture. My essence was also you need less architecture. You need Albert Kahn. And then you have a piece at the entry, and you have this element that says an architect was here and artistically or lyrically, et cetera, and that's it. And then the space, which has a loft and a workspace. And again, it could be anything you want it to be. And this lower floor that uh, makes the connection to the, uh, the auditorium space, which is part of the program. And then the ground floor, where you can see you're coming through it, and there's the lower space. You're moving through um, on, a, on a bridge, and then you're looking down at the, the um, that lower space, and then the upper floor. And again, the stairway that's in circle with this object in space and then the upper mezzanine floor, the roof. And then there's the section as it goes through the valley, as it lifts up, bridges that. And again, the very simple section as you have space underneath it, in this case, connecting to the existing building, and then the bridge part, and then again, these elevations, which are, we're now completely under investigation, and we're just looking at the, the materiality and the direction of those is really quite different than where we started. And then, um, Again, uh, everything's done in model. Everything's understood integratively. So when you look at the model, it's design, it's structure, it's mechanics, it's all the pragmatics. It's, it's, and it's, it's um, very different than the early models you made with cardboard and wood. It's, it's accurate in a way that sometimes is annoying. Because again, with computers, as you know, the line is exact line. There is no approximate line, right? It's a measured line. And so when you put these things together, 
you get way ahead of yourself. They look like they're much farther along than they are. They're still in a schematic phase, but they only look real because you're drawing, you're working um, in, in, a, um, in a very exact uh, environment, and you were used to working in an anexact environment. And so here we are, and we're looking at that space, and there'll be many of these, and we're just looking at this object in the space and a stair that floats in it. And we're now, um, just two days ago, we talked about that the stair is the structure that has to hold up the skin, and the skin wants to be light, and it's going to let a light in from the top. And again, um, the models allow us just to understand very specifically. Oh, you can see here it's floating. I don't want it to touch the ground. Right there, so it's suspended in space. So it's just it's this thing that just floats magically and enigmatically. Let's say it's it, we want it to be curious, right? That it doesn't touch the ground. If it touches the ground, duh, we can right, we, we can do that. We know that. Um, and I think that is it. Oh, I put one little piece in here. Can I go for five minutes? Just five minutes longer. Okay. I don't know. I don't know who was telling me. They kept telling me, don't keep talking about drawing, Tom. Don't forget the drawing. I said, okay, okay, I'll do the drawing. Uh, these are pieces out of a sketchbook and um, that, 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 that I've, I've done the sketchbook for years. And uh, These are just things that are, I'm just, I wouldn't say thinking. I'd be putting too much seriousness to it. They're, they're just um, random It'd be as if you were writing, and you're just writing random pieces of stuff. It's just stuff that's coming out. I'm not thinking a lot. I'm just drawing, and I'm trying to do it as unconsciously as possible. And um, this is what we do now. And um, this has uh, all the same ideas that I've been talking about in my work. And um, these are about um, some territory between willfulness and chance. And they have uh, infinite possibilities, each drawing. And they're, um, they're collective. Three of us worked on these. And um, they're my research that are leading to the work. And I'm searching for organizational strategies, not lineal, not axial, not biaxial, et cetera. I'm looking just for ways we organize buildings in a modern sense. And it's closer to the way we see biology than it is to classical architecture. And they're, um, these are actually interpretations of um, something I'm going to show you. And they're, um, they're print and serigraphs. They're, they're, I've done 23 of these that are um, a series of 10. And um, I would ask you, when people look at the studio, when I'm walking people, I ask them, are they um, coherent? Do they make sense? Or are they random? And if they're not random, then even if we don't know why they're organized, they're organized. And I'm interested in that, that absolute boundary when something is organized and we're still looking at why it's organized, but it clearly is not random. It's purposeful, and you can see it's purposeful. And I'm fascinated in that, and it came from this. Um, I've done 25 three-dimensional paintings, and I'm using the same process as we have in our office and I'm looking for new kind of directions. And um, these are just like the pieces I showed you in, in uh, Giant. These are all made from three identical pieces, an XY line, a Z line, a surface, and an object. Exactly the same piece. The, the, there's, well, there's three lines, thick, thin, and fat, and there's three vertical lines, the same. And what I'm trying to do is see how many very different things I can make out of the exact same DNA matter. So they're, they're, um, they're all of a family, literally of a family, right, with, with four types. And then I'm interested in material and, and the, 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 the transport of these things into a physical object. And I'm showing you just a few of these, but um, when I can no longer make something different, I stop. I've exhausted the project. So you can see where very literally that comes from. And I'm trying to make the leap. It's been fascinating because um, I worked with uh, somebody I brought from Cornell, then another woman from Cornell, and then two guys from Stark, four different people over two years. And I purposely not talked to the office a lot, just about none. And they just kind of show up on the walls. And I'm really interested in kind of what comes away, not speaking about them. And it's really amazing. It just shows up on the board. See, I say boards. There are no boards. It shows up on the computer immediately. 
it just absolutely comes, and, and it's really important to me that you're continually doing, you, you have to decide what your research is, what you're exploring to keep your own shelf life going, right? You're constantly looking for ways of kind of producing things, but they're going to be back to drawing, modeling, conceptual thinking, et cetera. It's going to be prior to architecture. Thank you so much. Do you want to do just a couple of three questions? Sure, of course. We have enough time for maybe two or three questions. Uh, go ahead. Okay, uh, just for the people in the other room, they would not have heard the, the he question. Asking, he was asking um, that the scales changed so radically, and um, how has it changed the strategy? Um, I don't know, I think I was lucky. I started um, in interesting complexity and in multiple systems, and so we were pretty much pummeled in the early work and saying little simple projects, way too complex, um, fetish was the word at the time, fetishizing complexity and intricacy. And it really never made sense to me because it'd be as if um, you said uh, amoebas are beautiful and porcupines are ugly. I mean, they're just physical characteristics and they can be very intricate and complex so they can be very simple. And it's, I never got that. But um, I think a lot of the, if you took Sixth Street House, if you took uh, the Venice Three, early, early projects, they already had embedded in them urban ideas they were implicit and not explicit. And um, so strangely enough, we were waiting. And I had friends of mine that recognized that. I remember uh, um, um, Weinstein, the dean at UCLA at the time, uh, was giving me critiques and talking to me. And was going, Tom, you, you have to wait until you get larger projects to accommodate a Kate Manalini. Because he said there's like eight projects there. And you just need more stuff to work with. And I think so again. Um, I'm more comfortable, and it's true, I'm much more comfortable with larger scale work. Um, although, hmm, I'd kind of like to go back. I haven't done a house for 20 years. But I think when people see most of this work, they don't think of like domestic, right? Yeah, I'm like going, why didn't someone give me a call and give me a house? I just like, it doesn't seem like it's happening. Um, and I'm like going, I look at uh, uh, Cooper Union and go, wow, I, someone should give me a, but that'd be a cool house. <laughs> really not. Well, that, that'd be something, um, Environment's change here. Really, really ultra conservative in this country right now. Tough to get a product out of this country. Used to be, like LA used to be the, that was where, for you guys. Um, like Cyark is a very entrepreneurial place like this one. And oh, maybe a third of the class goes right to work for themselves. And LA is this incredible environment. There were always additions, houses, shops, cafes that would service um, somebody right out of school. And that slowed down, even in LA. There's fewer and fewer people interested in any kind of experimentation. It's really, it's just a f funny mood we're in right now, yeah? And so it's, it's gonna, it, the house thing is gonna get more difficult because I think a domestic environment, it, it takes the most experimental. A lot of people that'll experiment with an office building wouldn't use the same architect for their own house. T Tom, I think the dog has a question over here. <laughs> the dog has a question for yeah, you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> any questions over here? There's a question in the back, let me, Get the microphone back up to you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So, oh, <laughs> sorry. So, well, first thing is um, you mentioned early on in your uh, talk that you couldn't talk about buildings until you had an elevator in them. And then you mentioned with Lawrence Tech, there's no elevator. So, you, well, but you, you want people to use the stairs, right? So it's like a circle back to the beginning, right? Anyway, that, that's just a comment. Um, the, the question I had kind of based on this drawing and the computer, I'm sorry, and, and how, you know, how it's progressed into that. Uh, recently I reread Todd Williams, Billy Sen's article on slowness and, you know, the, the art, the connection with the hand drawing. Given that, you know, your, your, your track of work is is leaving the hand drawing and it's going in the computer. Can you talk about, you know, compare it to Todd Williams' Billy Sen in a way? Um, look, if you, I'm a cuss guy. 
I, I was trained the way he was trained, and I was trained the way architects were trained for hundreds of years. Um, I could have been in a Beaux Arts um, institution. Uh, look, they happen to be friends of mine. Um, the real brutal answer is they just can't go certain places, period. And I would say they can't go anywhere interesting, period. For your generation, I couldn't imagine not. Um, what would an example be? If, we, if I took your iPhone away, you'd be screwed. <laughs> and you're going to go, no. I like the dial one where I could do this. <laughs> and so did my grandmother and my granddad. I can know a lot of people want to do that. But you, you, now you're somehow attached to some culture of an instrument, of a process or something, right? And, and you just have to ask very pragmatically, this, where does it take me? And I would say, not discounting the simplicity of a lot of buildings that don't require a lot, but I'm, in your own exploration of architecture over the next 50 years, you guys are just coming out of school in a time when the world is moving at the speed of light, right? And um, everything interesting will come out of the tools that are available to you. So the models I'm showing you, um, if you could look at this really close, you can't draw it, you can't conceive it, you can't make it. I could put 100 people together. I could take the top 100 people here and say you have a week to make the model. You couldn't do it. Add another 100, still couldn't do it. It's literally not possible. You cannot make this model. You cannot work out the connections. It, it's not doable. And it's, it's like any field. You enter medicine, uh, molecular biology, name your field, engineering, that your generation is the next generation making the generation in front of you obsolete. That's the idea. It's called evolution, right? And, and you, all you want is the, the tools that take you someplace. It's as simple as that. It's not, it's not complex, right? Um, and you can get both. BMW is coming out with their, their first electric car. And my wife had a, uh, the, um, Honda, the Honda Hybrid, the first one. It was a little experimental car, a little tiny one. And it was really typical of, of, of 60s energy thinking. Um, got 70 miles a ga gallon. You didn't drive it, really. You sailed it. it doesn't, it's not really a car. <laughs> and um, um, it, it was a little small, so it wasn't very comfortable. Really shitty radio. Um, no insulation. If anybody hit you, you're done. I mean, forget it. Um, and and you, you paid the price for everything to get your 70 miles an hour. Totally stupid. And it's stupid just was it's a, it's a really old-fashioned idea of giving up something to get something. BMW is coming out with a car. We did a competition for them that Wolf Pricks won. And I remember sitting with the head of design, and they were coming out with their first hydrogen at that time. Hydrogen car. Um, stronger, lighter, faster. And the car they're replacing was one of the big ones. It was the 800 or the 600, and it had like 500 horsepower. It was the new one was going to have 550 horsepower. And it uses no gas, right? That's what you have to do. And it's beautiful. And it's a great radio. <laughs> All right? No, really. And it's just not, and because again, they're, they're who they are. I'm not, this is not against Billy and, and Todd. They'll produce beautiful buildings, and it'll be of, of their era. They are going to be in their middle 60s or whatever they are, right? And I, I'm, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the gang I got working for me, or they're all, they average 35 or something. And no one would be interested in that. They want to do something they've never done before, right? And um, like I was discussing the, the use of carbon fiber, I want to use carbon fiber just because it exists. As simple as that. It exists. I'm going, damn. I was just talking to a guy that won a competition in Washington somewhere. And they wanted, they had a pavilion, very simple. They wanted it with Pete Walker, the landscape architect. And they wanted a pavilion. And they showed it with a really thin roof. And it was 100 feet. And they wanted it to be a foot. Right? 100 feet. A truss would be 8 feet, 9 feet, 10. It'd be 1 to 10, right? Um, they're connecting up with carbon fiber, and they can make a, be a, a plane of a roof at one foot that spans 100 feet. The trouble they're having, they can't find an engineer because it's proprietary. Normal engineers have no clue what carbon fiber is, and they don't have the techniques. Boeing, and Boeing with, with their, he's working with won't give them its proprietary information, and BMW and some of the car manufacturers all have it, but they've developed their own technology and they're not going to share it. 
but you can make it and test it. But the point being, of course, anybody here would go, damn, yeah, I want to be the guy that does the, the person that does the, the one foot span of 100 feet. It'd be just totally outrageous. And all it is is just using what's on the market, right? Simple as that. Anyway, I think, it's just, I think it's the appropriateness of the technology in terms of where you want to go. You just want it, what do you want it to do? How do you want it to work? Simple as that. And one final question. Hello. <laughs> um, in your Moroccan project, uh, I hope I heard you correctly, you mentioned that you flipped everything where the top became the bottom, the bottom became the top. And um, you mentioned that the urban was placed at the top. And I was just wondering what the reasoning behind that was. Because usually you want to you uh, activate the ground plane. And I was just wondering. That's a competition model. I haven't started yet, and it'll go through a lot of changes for sure. And it was a really, really kind of a simple model. We were just saying um, top and bottom have particular uses urbanistically. One local entry, streetscape, et cetera. One urbanistic from the city, from the vantage point of the city. The middle is um, workhorse. That's all. And it was, it, we probably won the competition because we, um, that's a whole other conversation, which is also dangerous because we made a very, very clear argument. And that goes back to strategy, which should be worth talking about. That strategy versus building. Make sense? Because the strategy people get, because you're working with business people, et cetera. The design, nobody gets. No, really. I mean, it's, architecture is as esoteric as, as poetry or classical, modern classical music. Nobody understands architecture. It's not an, you've never studied it. Um, I've had people that have been really aggressive about architecture. And I'll ask them, well, are you closer to, a Lucan or a Mies or Corbusier, and they never heard of those three people. <laughs> and I'll say, well, I just mentioned Yogi Berra and, and, and um, Mays and Lou Gehrig, so obviously baseball is not your sport, all right? And, um, no, and, but the strategy is um, a way of entering the project, which I think is your generation, because that wasn't mine, that's recent for, for me. And that one was absolutely strategic. We had just an ironclad little argument that just was sweet, because it's true, we, we understood that the body was the um, was the workhorse, and you wanted because what we said is this is where the architectural investment is, i.e., the dollar investment is on a top and a bottom, and we're now looking at that with the uh, skins, and we're starting with more raggedy three-dimensional skins, and they get smoother as they go up, because at, at um, 100 to 300, 100 stories, you don't care, you you don't you don't need it. It's a form, right? And so you, you start even developing ideas of a skin that has to do with scale, that has to do with that bottom top dialogue. And then we're going to say goodnight, right? We're going to say goodbye. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Tom Main. <laughs>